us start. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our February sit back seminar. Each month, MTRI hosts a seminar uh, on uh, biodiversity, wildlife and conservation. So my name is Chad Simmons and I am an ecologist here at the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute. Uh, but before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that MTRI is in and we are meeting from Gespoik, uh, one of the seven districts of Mi'kmaq, homeland to the Mi'kmaq people. We acknowledge- the people. Oh. I we, can't hear them. Just a reminder to please keep your mics muted. Uh, so we acknowledge the treaties of peace and friendship, and we thank the Mi'kmaq people uh, for their generosity in sharing their homeland with us. So for anyone who doesn't know, MTRI is a research-based nonprofit, and we are nestled in the heart of Southwest, Southwest Nova Scotia near Kedjimakou okay. National Park and National Historic Site. And uh, within the Southwest Nova and Scotia Biosphere now? Reserve, our mission is to promote, conserve, and sustain biodiversity in Guestwick and beyond. So tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce Anthony King. Anthony is the project manager from the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq uh, in their Department of Environment and Natural Resources. So next, I'm going to hand the seminar over to Anthony. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to remind everyone to please keep your mics muted. And if you have any questions during the talk, you can type them into the chat uh, or wait until the question period at the end. So with that, Anthony. Great, thanks, Chad. I'm just going to share my screen. Everybody see that okay? You can see that, eh, Chad? Yeah, we see it. Great. It's kind of weird to, for these presentations because once you share your screen, all you see is your presentation. Um, yeah, so I'm Anthony King. I'm from the, I work with the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq um, in our Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, I'm not Mi'kmaq myself, but I've been very blessed to work for and alongside the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia for the last about 10 years. Go up right there. Uh, yeah, so. And I started at the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. Um, I've always, I've, one of my first projects actually with Black Ash. Um, so I have quite a lot of experience working with it. Um, pretty much my first project out of, out of the Maritime College of Forest Technology was dealing with Black Ash. And it's been a, an amazing ride ever since. Um, these, uh, I, I kept this first picture in the PowerPoint to show a basket shop in Millbrook. First Nation. So originally there were six um, shops in Millbrook. And I just want to show the picture of the actual basket so everyone can kind of imagine what, what they look like if they've never seen a ash basket before. Um, this picture really shows how they're, how they're weave, to, weave together. And I really like to use the analogy that the black ash has really woven together a lot of people in the province and have made a lot of allies to, to help with their recovery efforts over the last few decades. So it's an amazing species that's brought a lot of people together. And we're hoping to continue the work with partners like MTRI, um, the province, and many others. So yeah, for the next little bit, I'm gonna go over the, the recovery efforts of uh, the Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia, um, mostly led by the Confederacy and mainland Mi'kmaq. So just a bit about black ash. So the, the Mi'kmaq word for black ash is wisco. Um, the rings are small due to slow growth and separate, separate easily. So this is why they're sought after for basket making. Um, strong and flexible can take eight seasons for the tree to produce seed. Take 55 years for a tree to reach optimum size for craft wood. And white ash can be used for strips, but aren't often thin enough. Um, Black ash is extremely, uh, it's a lot easier to use than white ash. It's used for finer, fancier baskets. It's just a much uh, preferred species to use because of its strength and flexibility. Um, as you can see too, and I'll, I'll touch on this later on in the presentation, it can take up to eight seasons for a tree to produce seeds. Um, so that's in between uh, seed years. Uh, it's been very to collect seed because of this. So it's very slow growing. 
it's now competed by a lot of things. Um, it has invasive species going after it now. Deer absolutely love black ash, so they're, they don't reproduce easily. So it has a lot of challenges to face. Uh, it's a broad-leaved hardwood tree, provincially widespread but rare. Last population estimates, approximately 1,000 trees, um, only 12 mature individuals. So this is constantly being updated as more trees are being discovered each year. Um, typically found in poor drained wetland habitats with seasonal flooding, especially wooded swamps and floodplains. They're used for barrels, baskets, tools, furniture, musical instruments, etc. And very culturally important to the Mi'kmaq and the Maritimes. So another thing that, that wiped out the population in Nova Scotia was barrel making. So they were used for the hoops to uh, called cooperage to, to secure wooden barrels because of their flexibility and strength. So they were kind of over harvested for that. And that did a huge number on the species. So basket making is a cornerstone of Mi'kmaq culture. So again, um, I've been lucky enough to, to learn from to hear stories about black ash, to really get a sense of how important it is to the culture. Um, it's been traditionally used for baskets, uh, but also used for tools, snowshoes, bows, baseball bats, and jigwagon, which is a sound maker, a musical instrument. Um, it's uh, extremely important to Mi'kmaq culture, not only because people use it as a livelihood to, to, to feed their families in the past, but there's also a huge social component to it um, for family structure where people would get together with their elders and they would learn how to do it and then the kids would learn from them and it would just be passed on um, the passing down of traditional knowledge and I, I chose this picture on the the right this is actually uh, Frank Muse from Bear River First Nation last week while with a uh, Picto from uh, Bucknick up near Anaganish um, this was a, a, a white ash workshop that we did a basket workshop because a lot of the um, a lot of the knowledge isn't being transferred anymore because there's a lot less people that know how to make baskets. And just having that time to, to sit down and learn how to do basket making is, is becoming more rare. So part of our programming is helping to facilitate that through workshops and training with youth that really want to learn how to do it. And Inugwe is a great example of that. He's actually a, an earth keeper, which I'll talk about later, a land guardian. And he really wants to learn how to make baskets and teach others how to make baskets. So we're helping to pass on that, that tradition any way that we can. Um, there's a lot of talk about species at risk, but I, I, I say sometimes that uh, cultural practices at risk are just as important because there's no point protecting the species if there's no one to use the resource in the future and that knowledge is lost. So just to give you a better sense to, I have a video here to show you the process. It's kind of a sped up um, overview of the, of the process of making a basket, but it just gives you a good sense of what goes into making one. That's basically it, but the uh, interesting part of it is uh, once we're making baskets is to see it go right from the basic splints right up to the finished basket. And when you get finished, you sit back and say, wow, that looked pretty cool. <laughs> So 
Sorry, bear with me, folks. There we go. Yeah, so that was um, that was Gerald Tony Senior. Uh, unfortunately, he passed a few years ago, but I used to love listening to his stories about his family in the Annapolis Valley that would build baskets as a whole family unit. They would produce up to 100 baskets a day um, for the apple industry, and they would get paid about a dollar a basket. But they had like an assembly line, and they would just complete to keep producing baskets every day to to um, support their family. Um, another really nice story that I used to say was um, they had other basket makers in the area. So his family had a competitive edge where for marketing strategy, they would stand on their basket. So that would really show the, the strength of their basket and they would always outcompete their competitors by, by doing that tactic. So that was, that, that was really interesting. Um, that video was actually uh, an opportunistic thing where I, I found out he was harvesting a white ash about a day before, and I grabbed a, a Nova Scotia Community College student from Dartmouth, and we ran down and, and got it on film. So we have a bunch of raw footage of Gerald doing the harvesting, and also a lot of um, his knowledge being passed down. Uh, so we're hoping to get that video created in the coming years to get that fully captured so we can get the... Um, complete process from start to finish talked about in on video, but it is captured luckily. Uh, so the provincial recovery plan, so the assessment and the recovery process. So there has been a decline due to wetland alteration and over harvesting and like I said, barrels and ship making. Um, a lot of wetlands have been altered over time. Uh, so the Mi'kmaq approached the province and, and wanted the species to be assessed because they knew the harvesters were out there and they knew that the, the tree was a lot less on the landscape than it used to be. So in 2013, it was listed as threatened in Nova Scotia after an assessment. And Nova, Sco and Nova Scotia was the first in Canada to assess for black ash. So right now it's, it's actually being looked at by uh, Kasiwik to see if it can be listed nationally. Um, 2014-2015, the Nova Scotia DNR in partnership with the Mi'kmaq prepared a recovery plan. And the co-led recovery team was endorsed by the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs, which are all 13 uh, chiefs in Nova Scotia. The co-chairs of the recovery team were Confederacy Mainland Mi'kmaq, Unamagi Institute of Natural Resources, who are a similar organization up in Cape Breton, and the DNR, Department of Natural Resources. Um, it was developed through a series of workshops. So the first workshop was very cultural focused and really uh, educated everyone on the cultural importance of the species. The second and the ones after were all focused on uh, the technical aspects of it and getting the, the recovery actions in place on the recovery plan. And collectively, there are over 40 Mi'kmaq knowledge keepers involved and a dozen Western scientists that contributed to the plan. So now I'm just going to go over um, the, the CMM's involvement in black ash recovery um, before and since then. So we've been involved with black ash recovery before the recovery plan was done because people uh, in communities realized it was important that we, we should start conserving it, knowing that there was less on the landscape. So in 1999, uh, the first seed harvest took place in Kajimakujik in Caledonia area um, by my predecessor, Alton Hudson. Um, those were collected to raise seedlings and start pl uh, planting a program across the province. Some of those trees are still in the communities today. Um, that was done for a couple of years and they just kept planting seedlings. Um, the final batch of that I was actually given to um, what, when I graduated from the Maritime College of Forest Technology as a forest technician, my predecessor uh, kind of trained me up and said, here you go, here's 5,000 black ash seedlings, figure out where to plant them. So that was one of my biggest challenges when I first started. And I'll, I'll get that, I'll talk about that in uh, more in 2016. Uh, 2015 was one of my first projects was the Wisco website, wisco.ca. And I'll go over that at the end of the presentation and also show you a screenshot of that. But it's a great resource that has um, identification uh, of the species that you can use on your cell phone. It's got a lot of history, videos, uh, resources for kids. We have a coloring book that we, we print, but you can download it on there. Um, a lot of papers and research. So it's just a, a nice um, central location. You can find a lot about black ash. 
and and all of these all of these activities that we've been involved with were from that original recovery plan. So there were actions that were were listed that needed to take place, and public outreach and education was one of them. So that's why we did the uh, the Wisco.ca website. Um, twenty fifteen to present, uh, we're still doing uh, more of these, but over a hundred previously unrecorded black ash documented and submitted to the Atlantic Canada Conservation Data Center. So. We are, we're always finding new ones um, when we're out in the land, um, especially sites that might have one or two observations on record. If you go up the river or down the river, you might find more occurrences that haven't been recorded before. So we've been doing a lot of that work. Um, 2016, 30, 30 habitat assessments were done across the province. Um, this ties back to those 5,000 black ash seedlings that I was handed. Um, in the past, people have kind of said that black ash grow in wet areas and not a lot of detail was, was provided with that information. So I designed a project to visit 30 habits or habitats across the province uh, to assess them uh, where they're naturally growing to see where the healthy, nice basket trees are so that we could plant uh, seedlings in similar habitat uh, near communities. So we did them all the way down from Yarmouth area to Marguerite um assessing 30 habit uh, habitats and we ended up planting well the results of that we actually determined um through the forest ecological classification manual so that's basically figuring out the specific habitat where something grows using soils associated ground vegetation um, other trees that are growing with it so we we're able to do that and we typed out the three uh, dominant um areas were wet coniferous, wet deciduous, and floodplain areas. And there's a bunch of subcategories in each one of those. Uh, but we were lucky enough to find three communities that were close to Millbrook, had an example of each in, in their community. So we, uh, we planted the, the seedlings in those communities. Um, and this will tie into the, the, the last uh, plan we have this year. But deer are a very big problem in Nova Scotia, and deer absolutely love black ash seedlings. So when we planted those, um, we tried to use a deer deterrent, which is basically uh, cow blood and vegetable oil, and we'd spray the trees. It was supposed to trigger a predatory response where the deer would think something was killed nearby and not go after the trees, but it ended up turning it into more of a salad dressing and didn't bother them at all, and they just wiped out all the trees. So we had to kind of revisit things and um, kind of reassess how we're going to plant seedlings. Uh, not only the deer, but they're also outcompeted by grasses and just all everything else because they're so, they're so uh, slow growing. So it's been a challenge the last couple of years to kind of figure, uh, figure out what we could do to get those in the ground and keep them alive. Um, 2016 to present, we've done a lot of community events. So we've been traveling around to the communities. Uh, we do the uh, annual Blair J. Bernard Feast in the Highlands on the Marguerite Airstrip every year set up a table to talk about black ash. We go to the Bear River Harvesters Gathering every year. Um, we present to our community advisory committee and just any community events we can get to, we get out and talk about black ash. Um, 2016 to present, thousands of seeds have been collected and submitted to the National Seed Tree Center. So it's a huge initiative that we've taken on to try to protect the, the seed source. Um, the invasive emerald ash borer is now in the province in the Bedford area. It's an invasive insect that is killing ash trees. So ever since that has happened, we've really shifted our focus to collect as much seed as we possibly can for future generations. Um, the National Seed Tree Center can store our seeds to upwards of 50 years in cold storage, and they can be used again for propagating and planting more trees in the future once we figure out how to deal with the invasive species. Um, 2017 started development of a protocol for development companies. So there was a, a gold company that ran into a black ash in one of their development sites. And because of the efforts of CMM and the Mi'kmaq and the, and the recovery team, um, it actually actioned, it triggered a bunch of action with all the groups to figure out what to do with this single tree. Um, so the province was involved, CMM was involved, the Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative was involved. And we ended up cutting the tree um, just because, and, and moving the stump. Um, just because there wasn't much we could do and there was a lot of timing constraints, but it made us really, um, and that wood was actually given to community to use um, for a resource. 
but it made us realize we need to develop some kind of protocol. So if companies do run into black ash, they know who to contact, um, what needs to be done for compensation and just monitoring long-term, anything like that. So that's what we started developing and it was finalized last year. Um, it's not implemented yet. It's just with the uh, Mi'kmaq rights initiative, but it was approved by the 13 Mi'kmaq chiefs in the assembly. Um, and that led to work in 2019 where they were doing the twinning of the highways near Anaganish and they ran into a stand of black ash. So we actually worked with Nova Scotia Public Works and uh, relocated some trees, moved them out of the way of the highway. Um, this time they cut the trees, but they moved the, the stumps in the proper way at the proper time of year and they were able to stump sprout, which means they got to uh, shoot up new shoots from the, the stump. So the tree's not dead, all the uh, energy was stored in the root system. Once it was planted again, it started to regenerate it that way. And again, that all that wood was given to the, the nearby Mi'kmaq community for basket making or whatever crafts, so it wasn't gone to waste. Um, 2019, we also did some planting in Kejimakujik National Park, a National Historic Site. So that's still down there. They, they were able to plant, uh, I believe around a hundred. And they used uh, tree tubes so they were able to protect them. They had the resources to, to protect them from the deer browse and other, um, other threats. And that's down by the Merrimack Hedge uh, encampment site in Kejimakujik. So if you're ever in that area, there are signs around that say the black ash plantation is there. And you'll, you'll definitely notice the big white tree tubes in the area. Um, 2021 to 22, train some community members on emerald ash borer trap monitoring. Um, so we've been working with the Canadian, for, uh, Canadian Food Inspections Agency to do um, sticky traps. So they're the big um, green uh, triangle looking traps you might see hanging up in different areas. So they use a pheromone and attract the emerald ash borer to stick to the trap. Um, so we've been setting them up across the province with uh, CFIA to help with monitoring. Uh, 2022, we did a genomic study with the uh, Department of DNR um, and the Canadian Forest Service. That was for studying the, uh, the, uh, the um, genetics of the black ash in Nova Scotia and comparing them to New Brunswick um, to see if there is possibility of bringing in other black ash from New Brunswick and helping with uh, future efforts if it's similar in uh, genetic structure. Um, 2022, we did inventory with Parks Canada. So we went through Kejimakujik and we assessed and inventoried all the black ash that were down in the park for future protection and just adding to the the database at the ACCDC. And in 2023, we have plans for a seed orchard at a Kane University. So I'll talk about all these. These are just a high overview. I'll talk more talk about I'll talk more about these in the rest of the presentation. So this is um wisco.ca. So really uh really easy website to remember. Um, and you can go on there and you can see there's information on the identification, the status, the threats, resources, news, and who to contact. Um, it's got a lot of traffic over the years. It's been a great resource and we, we plan to keep it going long-term to help with any education and awareness that needs to take place. So the habitat assessments. So this is just pictures uh, related to that. So. We, we assess the natural stands to plan for those plantings of the 5,000 seedlings. Um, we use the forest ecological classification. Um, and data sheet was actually developed with uh, the recovery team at the time. So I want to really ensure that we captured as much information as we possibly could while out there. And we also want to see if there's any patterns that we could recognize for future planting events. Biggest one being any associated ground vegetation. We ended up seeing uh, meadow rue a lot when we did the assessments, which is a sign of um, nice soil and associated species. Um, we also recorded aspect where the trees are facing, where they were on the uh, topography. A lot of them were at the, the base of hills, which was interesting. Um, just a lot of information. We also uh, did soil assessments to see what kind of soil they were growing on and um, did collect if there's any regeneration around the base of the tree, which we barely saw anything. Like we saw one tree the whole summer that had some regeneration around it. Um, none had seeds that year we went out. And um, we also assessed for basket quality. So I talked to some elders and added that to the information that we collected to assess if they were any good for baskets. So that would kind of 
give us an idea if they were the healthy, nice looking trees that we'd like to uh, uh, reproduce elsewhere in the province. Uh, this picture here, so this is two of uh, the summer students that were with us. Uh, that's Christian Francis from Pictou Landing First Nation. He's now um, in charge of our reef ball project at CMM, Artificial Reefs. And that's Sam Hames, uh, one of our summer students. So this was after a big long death march we did up, up and over a mountain in Inverness County. Um, they still talk about those trips now because we would bushwhack for hours on end to find one single tree in the middle of nowhere um, through some pretty harsh environments, but they, they were good spirits the whole time and they did a great job. Um, we, the way we, we found the black ash was actually old records that we got from the Atlantic Con Canada Conservation Data Center. Um, some of them were old and some of them were not accurate. Some of them were misidentified. So it was kind of disheartening to, to bushwhack through balsam fir thickets in the, in a, on a rainy day not to find the black ash, but most times we did. And uh, everyone would get really excited when we did find a black ash. Um, another benefit of doing this and seeing this many black ash across the province, a lot of us developed kind of a sense of where new black ash might be found if we're out on the landscape. And that's how we found a lot of new black ash. People would get a sense it might be around the corner. We go around the corner and there it is, just because you're kind of trained to recognize the, the patterns that we've seen across the province. We've done a lot of uh, outreach. So this is just, uh, this is one of my favorite ones that we've done. This is quite a few years ago up in the Marguerite Airstrip. Um, we were invited by Clifford Paul. He was doing the, um, the uh, member two uh, youth moose camp. So this is my past associate Connor Howard. He's no longer working at CMM, but he was in charge of the Black Ash project back then. Um, he's from Acadia First Nation. He was teaching the kids about Black Ash stewardship and telling a story, um, telling a legend about Black Ash from out west. And one of my favorite memories, he was talking about how the kids that we were talking to are now going to be responsible for the future stewardship of the tree. And they're going to be um, yeah, fully responsible for in the future. One of them stood, uh, sat right up in a sleeping bag and said, who me? And kind of said, yes, you're responsible. And then he started paying attention to the rest of the lecture more than he ever did. Um, at the end of it, it was a beautiful night. It was a full moon. We ended up walking up the uh, the airstrip. Um, the young fellow there on the left, he was playing the honor song and drumming. And we planted the black ash that we, we brought up with us under the full moon. And uh, I've heard from Clifford Paul that that memory has stuck with those kids for a very long time. So that tree may not have survived up on the airstrip, but the seed was planted. Then they really want to get more involved with black ash recovery. Uh, these are the planting events that we did um, in the three communities. So the top left was a Millbrook First Nation. So that was the wet um, coniferous site uh, near their powwow grounds that we planted. Um, bottom left was picked a landing First Nation. They had a wet deciduous site that we planted in. Also had some natural black ash growing in it, which was great. Um, and the one on the right is the bag and agate. We've, we planted down uh, around their school, but also down on their floodplain, which was a really rich site. This is Connor Howard, apologize for the quality of the picture, but this is him doing a uh, seed collection in the Oxford area, um, actually using a, a back, um, an ash pack basket to collect the seed, which is great from one of his uh, family. He was uh, cutting the, the trees down and uh, separating them and putting them in brown bags to be dried and sent to the uh, National Seed Tree Center for storage. And this is something that we've uh, continued to do every year we possibly can to get as many seeds as we can. This is also Connor in that uh, site I was talking about with the, the gold company. Um, this was the one tree that, that triggered a whole bunch of uh, process to, to make sure it was protected, which is really great to see. It doesn't matter how big the tree is, the tree is listed as a species at risk. So proper protocols are in place to make sure it's protected and taken care of or mitigated for any development that has to happen. Uh, the high rhino four mitigation. So this is pictures of the, the work that we did near Anaganish for the highway twinning project. So it was amazing to see how much work went into this um, relocation with the heavy equipment and all the crew that were, were helping from the Nova Scotia Public Works. Um, it was moved nearby and replanted. Um, 
and a lot of research and baseline information was collected to make sure that they would survive in the new habitat. Um, and they're actually planted near other black ash, so we knew that they, they should thrive in the area. Um, and this tree again was was harvested and given to the, the nearby Mi'kmaq community for use, so none of it was gone to waste. Um, a lot of our Mi'kmaq, uh, one of our Mi'kmaq land guardians, our earth keepers, were involved with this project and led a lot of it. Uh, and I'll talk more about that on the last slide. Already you can see, so this was uh, a few weeks later, they were already starting to stump sprout and regenerate after they were moved. So it was nice to see that they weren't too stressed by the move. And um, we are, we're gonna go back and assess how they've been growing the last year or two. But this, and this really helped with the development of the protocol for, for companies. So this is a, was a nice pilot to see how it would work. And we can follow this model for future um, mitigation that has to happen for any development. Oh, another point to to really emphasize too, this only happened because it was a safety issue with the highway. Um, Nova Scotia Public Works tried everything to prevent from damaging the species at risk, but because they needed to twin where they needed to twin, it didn't need to be moved. Uh, and it was from a safety standpoint. So species at risk aren't usually destroyed unless absolutely necessary, especially when the safety of humans are involved. So this is the emerald ash borer. So it's an invasive species from China. Uh, it's come over um, and it's spreading across Canada. It's all quite uh, prevalent in the United States. Uh, right now it's in Bedford. So this is where we did the training um, on the right here. This was last summer. Um, we've done this pretty much every year for the last couple of years. We get a few community members together and um, show them how to set up the traps and they would set them up in their own communities um, to add to the network of traps that uh, CFIA has across the province. So basically how they work, they just have pheromones that are hung in the middle of them that attract the insect and they fly towards it and uh, get stuck on the glue around the tree, around the uh, trap. We haven't found anything yet where we set them up, but we're going to keep, mo keep monitoring. Um, we really want to get ahead of things if certain areas, especially in communities, start to get infested and trees start to decline. We want to make sure that the resources are used properly. So we'll probably harvest to mitigate any impact on that resource. Um, this is the, so this is speaking back to the, um, the 5,000 seedlings that I was giving. So we didn't have success when we were planting these trees in the communities with the deer population and being out competed by other things. So what I decided to do was send a bunch of trees up to, send a hundred trees up to Strathmore Nursery in Inverness um, to grow them out to be five feet tall so that when uh, deer do approach them and nibble on them, they're not going to be destroyed. We want to really increase their chance of survival. So this was just taken uh, last summer. As you can see, they're doing very well up in Strathorne. Um, They've done a great job over the last couple of years, watering them and giving them um, fertilizer um, to make sure they're nice and healthy and grown nice and tall. Um, our plan this coming fall is actually to relocate these trees. Um, originally, they were planned to be planted in communities and in other areas, but because Emerald Ash Borer is now in Bedford, we kind of shifted our focus again and we want to establish a seed orchard for the future. So we're going to relocate these down to Acadia University. Um, and establish a long-term seed orchard down there that's going to be taken care of by both university staff and nearby Mi'kmaq communities um, for long-term reasons. Um, in this picture on the left is actually Earthkeeper Lenley Melvin and Earthkeeper Crystal Jeremy. So they are up, um, we were doing moose camps, um, moose check stations, and a couple other species at risk projects. So I brought them by to, to check out the, the black ash plantation. So they're key in, um, ensuring that these projects continue and have been very active in all the um, stewardship activities that have happened in the last couple of years. Uh, summer field work. So we've done, again, a lot of work with our partners at Parks Canada and DNRR and others, um, getting earth keepers out um, on, the, on the land, doing uh, habitat assessments and genomic studies and seed collection. So We've developed some really great partnerships with these organizations. And like I said at the beginning, it's really woven together a lot of us um, in a big network of people really passionate about conserving this tree for the future. 
So we hope to continue to develop those partnerships, um, get out with more partners in the future and get more community members involved with this work. So yeah, I thought I'd talk about the uh, New Jigilado Gatajig Earthkeepers. So the Earthkeeper Network consists of Mi'kmaq community members called Earthkeepers, take a leading role in protecting the natural world through environmental monitoring and reporting, the education on Mi'kmaq rights and responsibilities, their revitalization and intergenerational sharing of Mi'kmaq knowledge. Additionally, Earthkeepers play a central role in upholding and educating about Mi'kmaq environmental laws, concepts, and principles such as Nedigalim, Emsidogama, and Epidogama, or Two White Seeing. So I want, really want to finish on this because this is a new initiative. It's only a few years old now, but these, these earth keepers are really taking a lead role in conserving um, species at risk um, across the province. Um, not only do they have the, the Western science education on some of these species, but they bring a wealth of uh, traditional knowledge from their communities. And some even have a personal connection with the species, which brings such a, more dimension to, to protecting the species and makes it all, all the more important to do. Um, so they're very passionate about it. And we're hoping to grow this network in the next couple of years. So there'll be a lot more um, earth keepers out there doing all sorts of species at risk work and all sorts of other important work on the landscape. And that's it. Well, I'll look, thank you all. Awesome. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you so much for an incredible presentation. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, now's the time. And you can unmute yourself or you can type it in the chat, whatever you prefer. Hi, Chad. This is... Uh... Carol calling. Um, where, uh, where can we report uh, occurrences of black ash too, as well as uh, uh, the emerald ash borer if we see or suspect that it's in an area? Where can we report that to? Um, you can reach out to me. I'm, I believe my website's still on the website, or my email's still on the website. Um, the only thing with that, we really encourage people to take photographs of the leaves and the buds and the bark, just so we can really identify it um, over email, as opposed to us going out and checking the site just in case um, it's not what people might think it is. Um, just because we are pretty limited in staff, but we are definitely willing to go out and check the sites if people think they have black ash so we can record it. Um, if you're tech savvy and can GPS it too, that also helps us because then we can confirm if it's been recorded in the past or not, because we do, we might have the information already. Okay. Thank you. I believe too, on, on the website, there is uh, information from CFIA on the Emerald Ash Borer if there are some suspected infestations in your property that you can report to. Um, I'll double check on the website, but I can, uh, I can send the resources to MTRI if they'd like to share them after this um, webinar um, on their site so everyone gets a fresh uh, connection to those initiatives. Absolutely. I'd be happy to share that. And I know, too, um, if anyone does find an invasive species, they can report it to the Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council. They have a handy little button at the top right of their, their web page that says report an invasive, and they'll get it to the right people. Uh, so we do have some questions in the chat. Uh, the first is, how is black ash doing in New Brunswick and PEI? Is it severely endangered there too? It's more abundant in those provinces, but it is being assessed nationally. Um, nationally, it's been observed that it is declining. Um, I, I used to live in New Brunswick for a number of years, and it is quite surprising the difference that you see on the landscape when you're out. There, there are black ash and cedar everywhere that, like, I've been to in different parts of the province. And then when you come to Nova Scotia, there's almost nothing. So it's pretty drastic. Um, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure on PEI, but I, I believe they, they have a similar situation as Nova Scotia, but I, I've been primarily focused in Nova Scotia. So it's hard to say what their population estimates are or anything. Like that. Okay. Uh, next question. 
Do you know if any seeds were collected from the trees discovered in Western Inverness County in 2021? No, no, I think I know which which trees they're talking about. Um, it's funny, the seed collection is so difficult because it, it, it perfectly aligns with hurricane season and these seeds are wind dispersed. So we have a very small window when the, the seeds are ripe and when hurricanes start blowing them off the trees. So it's very difficult to coordinate uh, boots on the ground to get the seed collected. I think um, this year, um, we, we kind of had a false start. We thought that this was gonna be the eight year uh, seed year where all the trees would be full of seed. In the past, they've been observed, they'd actually been weighted down with that much seed that the branches were bending down with weight. Um, we haven't seen that. I haven't seen that yet since I started. Um, we thought that was gonna happen last year in Southwest Nova Scotia, there was some sign that it was happening. So we actually mobilized a provincial network of seed collectors, um, Parks Canada, DNR, a lot of partner organizations across the entire province ready for the seed for when it was going to be ready to harvest. Um, but it never happened, but it kind of lit the fire under our butts to get this network established. So we're ready now um, because like I said, it's a very small window between, okay, now they're ripe and now the hurricane's coming and blowing them off the trees. So we have to be very quick and organized to get it done. And it might be our only chance because if Emerald Ash Borer starts going after the trees, we can't wait another decade for the next seed year. So we're very, um, careful to make sure we have everything in place for that. Awesome. Okay, next question. How do you identify a black ash compared to a white? So the biggest ones I look at are the leaves. Um, maybe I can actually, I'll share my screen. I'll go to the, um, the website to further pitch the website. <laughs> So if you go to the website under identification, so we have this section. So you can actually click these on your, on your phone and expand them. So um, black ash is on the left, white ash on the right. There's no uh, petiole for, for black ash, so it connects right to the stem. There's no little stem to it, a little uh, gap there. Um, so whenever you're out in the forest and you look up at an ash tree, if they're connected like that and there's no gap, that's a good way to tell if it's a black ash or not. Um, the white ash usually has those gaps. So you can see right through the, uh, the leaves. Um, the leaf itself, uh, black ash has serrated uh, leaves. So like a saw blade where white ash is more round and bumpy. So that's another way you can tell. The buds, so in the winter time, uh, there's visible bark on black ash between the terminal bud and the lateral buds where white ash that doesn't exist. So you can compare them that way. Um, that's pretty much the only way you can do it in the winter time. Um, the seeds, and also there's, um, there's little hairs that are, are underneath the, uh, the leaf um, by the, uh, where they connect to the main stem. There's little red hairs. That's one of the ones I usually use to, indi to indicate. So it, I usually combine all these indicators at once to make sure it's confirmed that it is a black ash. The bark and the seeds, they're difficult to just use um, either one without comparing it to the other. But young black ash tend to be very corky. Uh, you, can, you can pretty much squeeze them. And it's almost got a, like, a yellowish tinge to it compared to the more um, the rougher white ash. Uh, also, what at, at the base of the tree where the roots flare out, the uh, black ash often has these little bumps or warts on them uh, that the white ash does not have. So, yeah, yeah, the lenticels, and um, I've also heard from um, Mi'kmaq knowledge keepers that they they look for the elephant foot where the the base of the tree will kind of flare out a bit at the bottom more than the white ash. So they've used that as an indicator too. Um, because it's a species at risk in Nova Scotia, um, if one comes across it in Nova Scotia, is it illegal, illegal to harvest it for um, for basket making in Nova Scotia? Yeah, for um, for non-Indigenous folks, yes, it is. Yeah. Good to know. 
Yeah, and that's that's part of our challenge too. Is we really want to create awareness, especially with um, uh, forestry, like with harvesters out there doing their job. Like they might not realize what they're cutting, or if someone's clearing like a power line or whatever. So we're we're helping to spread that education through the province and others to make sure that doesn't happen. It's very easy to to miss if you're not if you don't know what you're looking for. Okay. Uh, so the next question asks about uh, the habitat of black ash. And um, Cindy's wondering if you can elaborate a little bit on the habitats you're finding them in. I believe you said it was wet coniferous, wet deciduous, and floodplain. Can we dig into that a little bit, Anthony? Unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to comfortably. That was a couple of years ago now. Um, and I'm, I'm not a technical expert on the species. I'm more of uh, mobilizing the boots on the ground, getting people out to, to help with the species recovery um, and the education awareness part. But yeah, other than those, those top three, I wouldn't be able to speak to. I'd have to dig into my old uh, data sets to, to break that down more. Uh, do you know if it hybridizes with other ash species at all? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. I've heard it might hybridize with some white, but again, not not really my field. But yeah, I've heard I've heard that from experts that it can hybridize with certain species. Okay. Uh, so Ryan makes an excellent point that any species at risk potential occurrences can also be reported to the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables through their email at biodiversity at novascotia.ca. Uh, and Ken's wondering if you're comfortable sharing your email in the chat, Anthony. Um, there's a lot of people here, so if, if you're not, that's understandable. And uh, I can potentially connect you up, Ken, if you email me. And I, I think what I'll do, um, I'm, I'm quite honestly very swamped these days. So I might, I might start up a black ash um, email that we can check um, with other staff. Um, but that, that kind of is a good point because I don't want, um, a flood of emails. Not to say that would happen, but I just don't. I want to get back to people at appropriate times so they don't get lost in the shuffle. Uh, so someone asks if other ash species or other ash species populations are healthy or also at risk. Um, in Nova Scotia, the other ash trees are doing fine. Um, that, that that I know of. The, they still have the same threats, though, with the emerald ash borer coming through. Um, and they they might not be at risk now, but if that gets worse, they could be at risk in the future. Have there, do you know if there's been any sightings of emerald ash borer outside of the HRM? Not that I'm aware of, no. I know it's, it's also been observed in uh, New Brunswick. So we're kind of surrounded, um, I believe, Moncton. Uh, so Doug mentions that um he has found it in the forest ecosystem classification wet deciduous type two and wet deciduous type three so anyone who has used the fec before knows what that means otherwise it can sound <laughs> like gibberish yeah um, um do you know if red ash is in the province no, i don't believe so We've got uh, green, black, and white, and European that's introduced. With the success of the uh, seedling establishment, could you see continuing this project and expanding to other nurseries to establish saplings for transplants or future um, forests? Yeah, definitely. I think that's the long-term goal. Um, we really just have to focus our efforts now on surviving the emerald ash borer and making sure that trees are protected. So another reason I'd like to get them at Acadia is so that we can inoculate them against emerald ash borer so we can focus our resources and protect those trees. Um, the challenge there though, they have to be a certain diameter to actually inoculate them. So we have to let them grow and then inoculate them and it, it can be quite expensive. So um, we want to focus our efforts there and also collecting seeds from across the province for future planting efforts. But we kind of put a pause on planting now just because we don't know how the emerald ash borer is going to react on the landscape. And we don't want to put a bunch of effort into those activities just to have it um, wiped out in the short term. 
very fair. Uh, do you have any advice for anyone who would like to help with black ash recovery in the province? Yeah, I think the best thing people could probably use if they're tech savvy would be iNaturalist. They could take photos of the species and GPS them and they get confirmed by third party experts. Um, and that information can actually be sent to the um, Atlantic Canada Conservation Data Center to add to their data sets. Um, I think that would be the best um, because we don't know, especially on private lands, it's hard to know what's out there. Um, a lot of the ash in the province, black ash, were discovered during other projects. Like it wasn't a complete comprehensive looking for every black ash in the province. So some of those are really old information from the 50s and 60s. They might not be there anymore. Um, and just uh, DNR does a lot of their work on crown land, doesn't have access to the private. So any of that information would be really useful just to add to our uh, population. But the biggest thing is if not only do they find black ash, but if they're seed bearing, if there's seeds on those trees, we want to know. And if people are willing to allow us access to get on there and get those seeds, um, we definitely want to collaborate and get those collected for the future. Awesome. Okay. Hey. Oh, there's another question. Uh, do you know if there is any plan to identify and perhaps propagate from ash trees in Bedford that turn out to be emerald ash borer resistant? Not yet, but I've, I've heard about that happening in the States, but I think the research is really early on. Um, I've, I've only heard negative things from the States so far, and there's also um, biocontrols that they're, being, they're experimenting with in the United States. Uh, there's a lot of research that goes into a single tree. It's quite amazing. Um, but that's definitely something. There's, there's other invasive species that people have been looking at that as well, with like hemlock, oleodelgid, if there's a species that are adapting to it, certain certain trees. Um, so someone's just asking for a few more details about the Earth Keeper Network and yeah. talking about like what their primary focus is and who they can contact to learn more. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, it's just about the uh, the Earth Keepers Network and just talking about like what their roles and responsibilities are. And uh, if someone is interested in joining, who who can they reach out to? Um, yeah, so their roles are very, very broad and very um, crucial to what um, we're trying to do uh, with the communities in Nova Scotia, kind of revitalizing a lot of culture connection to the land. Um, these folks are going to be the stewards of all the lands and all the species on, on the landscape um, and also uh, helping to pass on traditional knowledge to learning themselves, but also helping to facilitate that passage to the younger generations. So it's quite uh, quite large in scope of what they're involved with. Um, we're not actively recruiting at the moment. Um, we are going to be looking for Mi'kmaq community members in the future to um, to work on a variety of projects. So we will be putting out um, like a recruiting campaign in the next couple of months to get people that want to do work either on a volunteer basis or a casual basis slash part-time basis, but there will be full-time positions in the future as well. Uh, so actually I misunderstood that question. So sorry about that. Um, the person was asking uh, if they have a potential project that Earth, Earth Keepers might be um, interested in working with them with how do they uh, go about that are earth keepers looking for potential new programs yeah um they can reach out to me i can actually i can send you my email oh you have my email chad to um forward to that person um we've i've been involved with the guestbook conservation collaborative for a couple of years now i'm kind of backed away a little bit um just due to other projects going on but we, we know there's a wealth of partners out there that are looking for help. Um, and I think the Earth Keepers are a perfect fit. Um, I, I help coordinate some of the Earth Keepers and the work that they do. So I could be a main point of, point of contact if anyone wants to reach out and, and see if there's interest in collaboration there. And I have put my email in the chat for everyone. Uh, so someone asked if there will be a link to this meeting. Yes, it is recorded and we will be uploading it to our YouTube channel and it's already on our Facebook. So you can watch it again tonight again if you want to. Uh, so Doug just mentions that red ash and green ash are the same thing. 
And Ken says there are some positive findings in resistant research, but it's early days. Hmm. Okay. So that's everyone's questions. Uh, thank you again, Anthony, so much for a very wonderful uh, presentation and so, so much hard work. It's quite incredible what you've accomplished over the years. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, so before we leave, I'd like to thank the Region of Queens, the Medway Community Forest Co-op, and the Working Woodlands Trust for supporting us in our seminar tonight. As always, you can stay up to date with MTRI seminars by following us on Facebook. And as I mentioned, if you want to watch tonight's again, it's already on our Facebook page. And in a few days, it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, so with that, we hope everyone stays well, and we get to see you all again very soon. Thank you. Great. Thank you Thanks, everybody. Much.